Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of Meet the Scientists. So I'm Chris Jones, and I'm going to be talking to scientists on behalf of COP26.tv. And we're going to be talking to Dr. Lucas today, um, who's exploring human tolerance and adaptation to um, limits of physical and environmental stress, particularly focusing on um, populations that occupy settings vulnerable to climactic extremes, such as the, the global south. She's exploring the therapeutic potential of exercise and environmental stress. So um, welcome, Dr. Lucas. Lovely to have you here. Hi, thanks for having me. So um, I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in, in your research. It was, it was great to have a, a little mini catch up earlier. Um, so if you could just sort of give a, a sort of nice overview, like summary of what, what is your current kind of research about? Sure. So uh, my background is actually in sports science um, and I am a, uh, an exercise physiologist and I work particularly in environmental medicine. So, so the bulk of my work and in, in teaching is focused on an uh, looking at how humans survive or thrive in extreme environments. And I particularly look at very hot environments. So, so looking at how we can work and how we can um, perform in, in very hot environments and how we can prepare to optimise our performance when we are exposed to, to extreme heat stress for a long time. Okay. And, and so you're, you're sort of looking... You're, your research is focused on um, sort of environmental stresses on an impact on the human body. Mm -hmm. um, wh whereabouts is your sort of research focused? What, just sort of what, what areas are you doing research? So I have uh, two main elements of my research. I look at, at the vascular uh, adaptations to heat stress or thermal stress. So a little bit of cold, but mainly heat. And I, I also look, um, and I work with athletes and I also work with uh, working populations uh, looking at how they can optimize performance and, and how they can um, prepare to be working or performing in a hot environment. So that would be the two main um, elements. So the vascular work I do is more focused on health benefits uh, for the general population in all parts of the world, where the applied side of, of my work looks at working populations and athletic populations. Okay, so um, if we focus on like the, the working population, so um, uh, what what sort of um, impact? Uh, you know, so obviously we're we're focused on looking at climate change, and obviously that there, there will be some areas of the world uh, which people bizarrely find uh, that might get a little colder because some of the the things like the weather systems um, slightly get distorted or changed. And so areas that were quite warm might become a little colder. Um, but generally, the consensus is that, that things will get warmer. Um, so what are the kind of immediate effects on the human beings that we might kind of see um, as temperature rises? Yeah, so so we already know quite a lot about how how... Uh, the limits of what we can tolerate in terms of hot environments. And, and as a race, human beings are very good at setting up behaviours to help us manage that. I think what's happening with climate change, which is changing some of that behaviour, is that uh, we're seeing um, regions get hotter, certainly, but we're also seeing an increased an unsettled weather pattern and an increase in extreme events. So, so places not typically set up to deal with hot events or extreme cold events are experiencing more frequently and at a greater intensity for a longer duration. And we're seeing some of those ramifications in, in our public health data as well. So um, that's on, on one side. I think on the other side of it is we also have uh, parts of the world that don't have the same sort of healthcare systems or protections in place for workers or for the general public. And, uh, and their traditional ways of managing their environment are becoming more and more threatened. So, you know, the breakdown of um, 
uh, of the natural environment increased in built environment that change in terms of of their of of the weather that, or climate that they're experiencing and how they manage that it's, it's all changing and coinciding with things like uh, increase in or, or industrialization of, of their communities and their countries and, and changing economies and global comedy economies having an impact as well and all of these forces are, are combining to to really highlight some of the very vulnerable population and workforces that we have around the world who are um, on the very knife edge of 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 the first people to be really exposed to the impacts of climate that's affecting their living, their health, their work, and how that's um, and the ramifications of that for them. So I think we're beginning to see that for the first time as well. So uh, it, it's it's a it's a challenging time, but a, a time for us to be able to to take action as a global community as well, which is exciting. Hmm. So we've sort of talked about the the potential. Um, implications i mean in terms of like the actual uh, locations of, of of research so what, what what areas are you kind of focusing on because obviously you talk, you talk about populations and looking sure. at like the data health data from those those different places um, so a key part of my research is working in Central America, and that's because there's a, an epidemic of, of chronic kidney disease of unknown origin that's been going on for the last 30 years, and uh, we don't know the cause of it, uh, and the leading um, hypothesis or the leading uh, um, cause we think there is is that it's connected to the work environment which is very hot and very strenuous so it's it's highly concentrated this disease and manual agricultural industrial agricultural workers performing very difficult manual labor they get very hot they're working outside in hot environments and the long-term effect of that could be having an impact on on their health and, and this um disease epidemic so we've been working uh, i'm part of a, a international collaborative group of scientists and um, public health advocates. We've been working in this region for, for the last number of years trying to do research to, to find out the, the cause of this uh, devastating disease in these local communities, but also to try and, and bring it, put in place an immediate uh, intervention to those work environments to improve the worker protections in these industrial sugarcane mills. So that's a key part of the work that I've been doing in recent years. I've also worked in, in parts of India looking at, at workers' health and the impact of heat in, in, um, in hot environments in that, in that part of the world as well. So that's, that's where some of my research has been focused. So in terms of like the, um, the, the temp, like the, the climactic difference between South America and, and Central America and, and, and India, um, what are the sort of key um, yeah, climactic differences? So we can see if we look at uh, climate data over um, the last several decades, we can, we can see those um, trends of increases in, in maximum temperatures and uh, daily averages. So those regions are, are showing an increase in trends that you see across uh, across the world and, and particularly in hot regions. Um, there is, uh, particularly in India, there's a real increase in, uh, in extreme events um, and, and across the full range, I guess, uh, India is a, a much larger place, so they get the full range of weather impacts when it comes to extreme events. So typhoons, hurricanes, heat waves, um, that they, they are, are well aware. Um, also vector-borne diseases and the increased rate of vector-borne diseases, which is connected to the climate as well, has seen a, an increase in both those regions and other, so other just, developing Just to regions. clarify for, for, for people that don't know, so, so what, 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 how would you define a vector? Have you got an example of a vector? Yeah, sure. So um, vector-borne diseases, like diseases carried by mosquitoes. So um, malaria or... Um, um, dengue is probably as a, as a common one, um, or um, uh, I can't remember how to pronounce it. I better not go. We'll go with dengue. dengue. That's probably the best one to go for. So, so there's so there's there's a, a range of, of illnesses that are uh, or, or effects that are happening across the board. Although that's probably not my area of speciality. I'm, I'm getting outside my comfort zone. My area is very much on the um, on the heat stress. Mm. So in terms of like India, you know, I've, I've worked with, with people in India and they're, they're 
they've talked about temperatures reaching sort of 50 degrees. Yeah. Um, you, me you mentioned about sort of like the maximum sort of tolerances. You know, so this is currently they're reaching sort of temperatures of about 50 degrees outside. What 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 do we know in terms of human tolerance for temperature? So, um, it, it, again, it's it's hard to put a set number on it because behaviour patterns really have a, a huge impact. So our first defence against uh, extreme weather is is always our behaviour, how we how we. Um, manage our behaviour. So I think the the you know clothing we wear, the water we take on board, the hydration practices when we choose to work, um, how how fast or intense the work is. These are all behaviour patterns that are that are modified. I think uh, you know you can. It's very difficult to work or to move uh, and do any any um, yeah any physical work and and temperatures of 50 degrees. We don't really know what chronic exposure at that level will, does to us. We haven't really, um, most of the uh, behavior patterns uh, developed by people living in, in hot climates avoid those, those sort of um, prolonged exposure. So it's difficult to say outright, but, but um, you can tolerate it, but you, you will have to have behavioral patterns in place to, to help you do that. I think in, in places like India and Central America, what we are seeing is that changing patterns, changing um, lifestyle patterns are occurring because of the increase in the duration, increased duration of how much, how long a period of the day is too hot to work in or too hot to do things in uh, and the temperatures that they're exposed to. So, so work patterns are becoming uh, very polarized. People have to work very early and very late in the evening. Um, in both places. We're, in Central America, we're trying to prevent um, uh, one of the mitigation strategies we're putting in place is not working beyond you know, midday when the heat of the, the sun is out there, but that has ramifications in terms of how many hours people can work or how early they need to start. And this has flow on conf, um, consequences to family life and uh, you know, community economy and health uh, and work well-being as well. So we, we know that uh, working shift patterns outside of our daily rhythms isn't good for us long term either. So so there are, I think those consequences are the ones that we're really seeing immediately. We can cope with with the current temperatures just, but we're reliant on things like air conditioning perhaps or um, other cooling strategies which which aren't always available, particularly to vulnerable populations. Um, with less resources, uh, and also some of those mitigation strategies are actually making the you know, our, our climate, our CO two burden, and our climate uh, worse in the long run. So the you know air conditioning, for example, is is pumping out lots of hot air into those urban heat island effects. So so it's kind of uh, perpetuating that 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 uh, circle of increasing heat as well, which is which is a problem. So thinking about longer term strategies that we can maintain is is crucial. Thank you.